It is not hard to live through a day if you can live through a moment. What creates despair is the imagination which pretends there is a future and insists on predicting millions of moments, thousands of days, and so drains you that you cannot live the moment at hand. That is what Father Paul told me in those first two years on some of the bad nights when I believed I could not bear what I had to the most painful loss of my children than the loss of Gloria, whom I still love despite, or maybe because of our long periods of sadness, that rendered us helpless, so neither of us could break out of it to give a hand to the other. Twelve years later, I believe ritual would have healed us more quickly than the repetitious talks we had, perhaps even kept us healed. Marriages have lost that, and I wish I had known then what I know now, and we had performed certain acts together every day, no matter how we felt, and perhaps then we could have subordinated feeling to action, for surely that is the essence of love. I know this from my distractions during Mass and during everything else I do, so that my actions and feelings are seldom one. It does happen every day, but in proportion to everything else in a day, it is rare, like joy. The third most painful loss, which became second and sometimes first as months passed, was the knowledge that I could never marry again, and so dared not even keep company with a woman. On some of the bad nights, I was bitter about this with Father Paul, and I so pitied myself that I cried, or nearly did, speaking with damp eyes and breaking voice. I believe that celibacy is for him the same trial it is for me, not of the flesh, but the spirit, the heart longing to love. But the difference is he chose it and did not wake one day to a life with thirty horses. In my anger, I said I had done my service to love and chastity, and I told him of the actual, physical and spiritual, plan of practicing rhythm, nights of striking, the mattress with a fist, two young animals, side by side in heat, leaving the bed, to pace, to smoke, to curse, and too passionate to question. For we were so angered and oppressed by our passion that we could see no further than our loins. So now I understand how people can be enslaved for generations before they throw down their tools or use them as weapons, the form of their slavery, the cotton fields, the shacks and puny cupboards, and untended illnesses, absorbing their emotions and thoughts until finally they have little or none at all to direct with clarity and energy at the owners and legislators. And I told him of the trick of passion and its slaking, how during what we had to believe were safe periods, though all four children were conceived at those times, we were able with some coherence to question the tradition and reason and justice of the law against birth control but not with enough conviction to soberly act against it as the regular satisfaction in bed tempered our revolutionary as well as our erotic desires only when abstinence drove us hotly away from each other did we receive an urge so strong it lasted all the way to the drug store and back but always after release we threw away the remaining condoms and after going through this a few times we knew what would happen and from then on we submitted to the calendar she so precisely marked on the bedroom wall i told him that living two lives each month one as celibates one as lovers 
made us tense and short-tempered, so we snapped at each other like dogs. To have endured that, to have reached a time when we burned slowly and could gain from bed the comfort of lying down at night with one who loves you and whom you love, could for weeks on end go to bed tired and peacefully sleep after a kiss, a touch of the hands, and then to be thrown out of the marriage, like a bundle from a moving freight car, was unjust, was intolerable. And I could not, or would not muster, the strength to endure it. But I did, a moment at a time, a day, a night, except twice, each time with a different woman and more than a year apart, and this was so long ago that I clearly see their faces in my memory, can hear the pitch of their voices and the way they pronounced words. One with a Massachusetts accent, one Midwestern, but I feel as though I only heard about them from someone else each rode at the stables and was with me for part of an evening. One was badly married, one divorced, so none of us was free. They did not understand this Catholic view, but they were understanding about my having it. And I remained friends with both of them until the married one left her husband and went to Boston, and the divorced one moved to Maine. After both those evenings, those good women, I went to Mass early, while Father Paul was still in the confessional and received his absolution. I did not tell him who I was, but of course he knew, though I never saw it in his eyes. Now my longing for a wife comes only once in a while, like a cold on some late, wake one day to a life with thirty horses. In my anger I said, I had done my service to love and chastity, and I told him of the actual physical and spiritual plan of practicing rhythm, nights of striking the mattress with a fist, two young animals side by side in heat. Leaving the bed to pace, to smoke, to curse, and too passionate to question, for we were so angered and oppressed by our passion that we could see no further than our loins. So now I understand how people can be enslaved for generations before they throw down their tools or use them as weapons, the form of their slavery, the cotton fields, the shacks and puny cupboards and untended illnesses, absorbing their emotions and thoughts until finally they have little or none at all to direct with clarity and energy at the owners and legislators. And I told him of the trick of passion and its slaking, how during what we had to believe were safe periods, though all four children were conceived at those times. We were able with some coherence to question the tradition and reason and justice of the law against birth control, but not with enough conviction to soberly act against it as the regular satisfaction in bed tempered our revolutionary as well as our erotic desires. Only when abstinence drove us hotly away from each other did we receive an urge so strong it lasted all the way to the drug store and back, but always, after release, we threw away the remaining condoms, and after going through this a few times, we knew what would happen, and from then on we submitted to the calendar she so precisely marked on the bedroom wall. I told him that, living two lives each month, one as celibates, one as lovers, made us tense and short-tempered, so we snapped at each other like dogs. To have endured that, to have reached a time when we burned slowly and could gain from bed the comfort of lying down at night with one who loves you and whom you love.
could for weeks on end go to bed tired and peacefully sleep after a kiss, a touch of the hands, and then to be thrown out of the marriage like a bundle from a moving freight car was unjust, was intolerable, and I could not or would not muster the strength to endure it. But I did, a moment at a time, a day, a night, except twice, each time with a different woman and more than a year apart. And this was so long ago that I clearly see their faces in my memory, can hear the pitch of their voices and the way they pronounced words, one with a Massachusetts accent, one Midwestern, but I feel as though I only heard about them from someone else. Each rode at the stables and was with me for part of an evening. One was badly married, one divorced, so none of us was free. They did not understand this Catholic view, but they were understanding about my having it, and I remained friends with both of them until the married one left her husband and went to Boston, and the divorced one moved to Maine. After both those evenings, those good women, I went to Mass early while Father Paul was still in the confessional and received his absolution. I did not tell him who I was, but of course he knew, though I never saw it in his eyes. Now my longing for a wife comes only once in a while, like a cold on some late afternoons, when I am alone in the barn, then I lock up and walk to the house, daydreaming, then suddenly look at it and see it empty, as though for the first time. And all at once, I'm weary and feel, I do not have the energy to broil meat, and I think of driving to a restaurant, then shake my head, and go on to the house, the refrigerator, the oven, and some mornings, I wake in the dark, and listen to the silence, and run my hand over the cold sheet, beside me, and some days in summer, when Jennifer is here. Gloria left first me, then the church, and that was the end of religion for the children, though on visits, they went to Sunday mass with me, and still do, out of respect, for my life that they manage to keep free of patronage. Jennifer is an agnostic, though I doubt she would call herself that any more than she would call herself any other name that implied she had made a decision. A choice about existence, death, and God. In truth she tends to pantheism, a good sign, I think, but not wanting to be a father who tells his children what they ought to believe, I do not say to her that Catholicism includes pantheism like onions in a stew. Besides, I have no missionary instincts and do not believe everyone should or even could live with the Catholic faith. It is Jennifer's womanhood that renders me awkward. And womanhood now is frank, not like when Gloria was twenty and there were symbols, high heels and cosmetics and dresses, a cigarette, a cocktail. I am glad that women are free now of false modesty and all its attention paid the flesh, but still it is difficult to see so much of your daughter. To hear her talk, as only men in body, women used to, and most of all to see, in her face the deep and unabashed sensuality of women, with no tricks, of the eyes and mouth to hide, the pleasure she feels, at having a strong young body. I am certain, with the way things are now, that she has, very happily not been a virgin, for years. That does not bother me. 
What bothers me is my certainty about it. Just from watching her walk across a room or light a cigarette or pour milk on cereal. As he told me all of it, waking me that night I had gone to sleep, listening to the wind in the trees and against the house, a wind so strong that I had to shut all but the lee windows, and still the house cooled. Told it to me in such detail and so clearly that now, when she has driven the car to Florida, I remember it all as though I had been a passenger in the front seat or even at the wheel. It started with a movie, then beer and driving to the sea to look at the waves in the night and the wind, Jennifer and Betsy and Liz. They drank a beer on the beach and wanted to go in naked but were afraid they would drown in the high surf. They bought another six-pack at a grocery store in New Hampshire and drove home. I can see it now, feel it, the three girls, and the beer and the ride on country roads where pines curved in the wind and the big, deciduous trees swayed and shook as if they might leap from the earth. They would have some windows partly open so they could feel the wind. Jennifer would be playing a cassette, the music stirring them as it does the young, to memories of another time, other people, and places in what is for them the past. She took Betsy home, then Liz, and sang with her cassette as she left the town west of us and started home. A twenty-minute drive on the road that passes my house. They had each had four beers, but now there were twelve empty bottles in the bag on the floor at the passenger seat, and I keep focusing on their sound against each other when the car shifted speeds or changed directions. For I want to understand that one moment out of all her heart's time on earth, or whether her history had any bearing on it, or whether her heart was then isolated from all it had known, and the sound of those bottles urged it. She was just leaving the town, accelerating past a nightclub on the right, gaining speed to climb a long, gradual hill, then she went up it, singing, patting the beat on the steering wheel. The wind loud through her, few inches of open window, blowing her hair, as it did the high branches, alongside the road, and she looked up at them and watched the top of the hill for someone, drunk or heedless, coming over it, in part of her lane. She crested to an open, black road, and there, he was, a bulk, a blur, a thing running across, her headlights. And she swerved left, and her foot went, for the break and was, stomping air above, its pedal when she hit him, saw his legs and body, in the air, flying out of her light, into the dark. Her brakes were screaming, into the wind, bottles, clinking in the fallen bag, and with the music, and wind inside, the car was his sound, already a memory, but as real as an echo. That car shuddering, thump as though she had struck a tree. Her foot was back on the accelerator. Then she shifted gears and pushed it. She ejected the cassette and closed the window. She did not start to cry until she knocked on my bedroom door, then called, Dad? Her voice, her tears, broke through my dream and the wind I heard in my sleep. And I stepped into jeans and hurried to the door, thinking harm, rape, death. All were in her face, and I hugged her and pressed her cheek to my chest and smoothed her blown hair, then led her, weeping, to the kitchen and sat her at the table 
where still she could not speak nor look at me when she raised her face it fell forward again as of its own weight into her palms i offered tea and she shook her head so i offered beer twice then she shook her head so i offered whiskey and she nodded i had some rye that father paul and i had not finished last hunting season and i poured some over ice and set it in front of her and was putting away the ice but stopped and got another glass and poured one for myself too and brought the ice and bottle to the table where she was trying to get one of her long menthols out of the pack but her fingers jerked like severed snakes and i took the pack and lit one for her and took one for myself i watched her shudder with her first swallow of rye and push hair back from her face it is auburn and gleamed in the overhead light and i remembered how beautiful she looked riding a sorrel she was smoking fast then the sobs in her throat stopped and she looked at me and said it the words coming out with smoke i hit somebody with the car then she was crying and i was on my feet moving back and forth looking down at her asking who where where she was pointing at the wall over the stove